great. Well, thank you so much and good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to panel 11 of the Electoral Integrity Project Conference. Um, this panel is focused on advancing model commitments on electoral integrity and is a panel that is co-convened by International IDEA and the Carter Center. My name is Avery Davis Roberts. I'm an Associate Director in the Democracy Program at the Carter Center, and I am really excited uh, to be your moderator for what I think will be a very interesting and wide-ranging discussion. So we had a little write-up in the program, and the first sentence was one that I just thought was so poetic that I was going to steal it. Um, and so we're going to start off by just reminding everybody that genuine democratic elections are the keystone in the arch of democratic governance. They are the expression of the democratic tenets that sovereignty resides in the people and that the authority of government is derived from the exercise of the right to vote and to be elected through universal and equal suffrage and periodic elections. Of course, as we all know, we are facing challenges to just even the idea, honestly, of democratic elections in many countries around the world, both in the North and in the global south. And some of these challenges are old challenges. Uh, some are newer, you know, they range from anti-democratic transnational interference in elections to the use of disinformation to just sort of undermine and erode trust in election administration to preemptive challenges to election results to, you know, threats to the very sort of the frontline workers of our electoral processes to election officials. And so that we know that the threats are manifold. Um, the current global climate with regard to electoral integrity and trust in elections has really heightened the need for explicit and clear discussions about the responsibilities of a state with regard to ensuring democratic elections while also recognizing at the same time that non-state act actors, civil society, uh, business, play an important role in the administration of the electoral process and the right to participate that is exercised through that process. Those are just a few of the stakeholders, right? Election management bodies, businesses, civil society who have an interest in the credibility of election processes. But we also have to think about voters and the election management bodies and election observers and international organizations and even other nations who really have an interest in sort of peace and stability that is um, central uh, or sort of an outcome of, of democratic processes. And we saw that this interest of other nations and sort of democracy writ large around the country, around the world, uh, was really sort of the basis for the summit for democracy that we'll be talking about in this session. So it's really in this context of certain democratic challenges around the world, an increasingly complex constellation of stakeholders that are all talking and thinking about uh, democratic elections, that the idea of the model commitments that we will be discussing arose. Several international organizations have cooperated in uh, providing two countries uh, and electoral integrity advocates a new set of commitments to better ensure the integrity of elections. Uh, and a part of that is also thinking about how we can work together to promote uh, electoral integrity using these commitments. The model commitments are really sort of a starting point and we'll be talking about them in the session. They're really a st starting point rather than sort of a definitive and comprehensive list, but we think of them as minimum commitments concerning the principal areas of electoral integrity. And we want to think about together today, ways that we can kind of take those commitments forward and deepen them. In the session, we're going to be talking about a number of things. We'll answer a number of questions and probably leave with more questions than we answer. Um, but some of the questions are, are sort of like, what are model commitments and why do we need them? What did the Summit for Democracy kind of contribute to this conversation around model commitments or commitments around electoral integrity? Who needs to be a part of the conversations about uh, commitments? Who needs to be a part of the implementation of those commitments? And how do we know if the commitments are, are working? How do we measure adherence to them? Um, this, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you are, we kind of have 
uh, a session that I think of as being in three acts. Uh, act one will focus a little bit on the Summit for Democracy. So we'll hear from Julia Koitkin, who is a program manager for the Supporting Team Europe Democracy Project, STED, uh, with the Regional European Program in Brussels and International IDEA. Julia will talk about the Summit for Democracy, sort of how commitments fit into that process and, and what commitments did we have out of that summit process specifically related to electoral integrity? Did we have any? Uh, act two will be a conversation about the model commitments that were pulled together by the Carter Center and International IDEA with input from other organizations like NDI and IFES. And we'll also be thinking a little bit about the sort of the, the, the relevance of those commitments to the research research community in Act 2. And Act 2 will be a conversation between David Carroll, who is director of the Democracy Program uh, at the Carter Center, uh, Pat Merlo, who uh, was lead drafter of the model commitments, has been working with the Carter Center, International IDEA, uh, the US Electoral Reformers Network in his uh, post-NDI career. Uh, both David and Pat have a number of years working on election related issues uh, uh, around the world. And so really brought that experience to, to the development of the model commitments. And they'll be joined by Marcella Morris, who uh, holds a PhD in political science from Emory University and was a recent Democracy and Electoral Integrity Fellow uh, at Emory in conjunction with the Carter Center. Then Act 3 of our session will feature Clara Cole, who will talk a little bit about sort of what do these commitments mean? What do democratic norms mean for implementers, right? How, how does this work on the ground for those that are doing, doing their work around elections? And then we'll hear from Ambar Zobari, who will talk a little bit about community. What can community do to help make these norms and commitments real? How do we build a broad community that really moves the conversation forward? So a lot of different aspects of sort of this model commitment idea will be covered in this session. We will um, talk for 45 minutes to an hour, uh, then we will have time for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll come to those at the end of the session. Or when we get to that time, of course, we'd love for you to just put your hand up so we can so we can hear your voice. But let me start with you, Julia. Can you just maybe tell us a little bit about the Summit for Democracy um, and what commitments arose out of that process with regard to electoral integrity? What worked, what didn't work? Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Avery. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just to put this a little bit into context, I think that's it's quite important that we go back to what really was the summit, because some of you might not really be familiar, very familiar with the summit, you might have heard about it, but so just in one second to put it back uh, into context, President Biden actually uh, held the first summit uh, of democracy in, in 2021. Um, and it focused really on three topics, and those were anti-corruption human rights and countering authoritarianism. And so elections really wasn't kind of part, it was discussed in this first iteration, but it wasn't like the main focus that was chosen in 2021. But 110 countries were invited and about 898 uh, US and EU were attended actually. So then what we saw is in 2020 U, uh, 2022, sorry, the year of action. And that's very important because during this year of action, a lot of things actually happened and new topics around democracy surfaced. Um, and so what we had then in 2023 um, is the, the second summit, and that were basically partly co-hosted by other countries as well. And their elections actually became one of the topics um, in Zambia. And I see uh, some of you uh, might, have, uh, might have joined at that particular uh, event in Zambia. Um, and so there, there were different focuses as well, um, other topics around democracy, and about 90 countries attended uh, that second summit. And we know that there will be a third summit, um, which has been announced uh, in South Korea, probably in March of 2024. So that's just for the context. But then 
what are we talking about really when we talk about commitments under the Summit for Democracy? So they were really part of the inter integral, uh, inter an integral part, sorry, of the Summit for Democracy. So we had lots of commitments, both internationally and domestic that were made during the summit, the first Summit for Democracy by participating governments. And these participating governments um, made these commitments through either verbal statements, um, so they announced commitments during, during the summit, during the first summit, and 59 countries then followed up with written commitments. Um, and again, those really varied in topics, um, and so elections was, was very much a part of it. And at the uh, second summit, about 90 countries made verbal statements. Uh, again, and there the focus was more about the implementation of commitments. So what really came out of the commitments that were made in 2021? So again, when we look at the first summit for democracy, we see actually that the commitments were quite weak. Here you see some of the themes and we've organized them per countries that made them. Um, some of them, um, really the actions or the commitments that were um, that were made were actually actions that were planned or things that were already planned. Um, they had very little, um, they were very, there were not a lot of commitments that had actually clear indicators. So you could really track, you know, progress. Um, and then of course, the main issue around the, the summit and the commitments are that there was never a formal monitoring mechanism around those. Um, so, so this is just to set the, 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 the scene. Um, the electoral commitments, if you want to see all the electoral commitments, International IDEA has put together this um, web, this platform where you can check all the commitments per theme, but also per country. And here I've just given a couple of examples of those commitments just to show how what they were like. So the DRC, for example, made a a commitments around organizing elections within constitutional deadlines. So this is a very large commitment, obviously. Um, but then when we look at 2023, the implementation, then, um, you know, they talk about the electoral calendar being published um, and the voter registration having started in the west of the country in the DRC. So they talked quite a bit about the implementation of those. Belgium, for example, they had um, a commitment around lowering the voting age uh, to 16 in European Parliament elections. And they actually discussed those in the implementation of, um, of the commitment. So in the verbal statement around the implementation of commitments. Um, a country like Australia made quite concrete and, and measurable commitments in a way, measurable action around specific legislation they wanted to change. But then when it came to the second summit in the verbal statement, they didn't actually refer to what they had done in terms of implementation. It doesn't mean they haven't done anything. It just means that they haven't specifically talked about what exactly, what steps were taken during the year of action. Um, and then the, the final one is, is Chile, for example, where um, they were quite concrete in the objectives. So ensuring political uh, candidates in election refrain from inciting election related violence. But then in terms of the measurable actions, that wasn't really very clear. And then again, they didn't mention anything during the second summit. So when we look at the second summit themes, um, elections actually was quite high. It came up third, most frequent topic uh, that was mentioned. Uh, and that was again, a little bit in contrast with the 2021 top, uh, summit where um, it, it, was, it was ranked actually lower. Um, so a bit more around elections this time. Um, when we now look at some examples of implementation, um, here, I just cited three. Uh, in Moldova, a new electoral code was, was, um, was adopted. In Zambia, there was a post-2021 general election review, and that was quite important there. In Ireland, they established an independent commission. Again, if you look at this, it doesn't seem like it's really maybe anything new. 
But the only thing I would say that it has done is maybe those were things that countries like Moldova wanted to do already, because indeed they are part of the nine conditions set by the European Union in 2022, in June of 2022. But what it, the summit did is accelerate the implementation of these different types of action. Just to say that despite the lack of clarity on what will be the future, so we haven't received anything concrete from South Korea at the moment, um, about 30 countries still made some commitments for the future, including some electoral uh, commitments that you can see here. Um, so in terms of some reflections, uh, I think that overall, um, you know, we, we've just done a report where we actually argue that the we believe that the commitment process in itself is a good one. Um, however, they need to be really clarified a bit better. There needs to be measurable. These commitments have to be measurable. Um, there's also no tracking, uh, so no lack of monitor. There's a lack of monitoring and evaluation framework that is really missing around these commitments. And it might be useful, and that's why it's really great that um, you're, that this has been taken forward, um, is drafting of model commitments could be quite useful to really inspire countries around what are the types of commitments that they could make under the Summit for Democracy. And just to, to say one final point, I think, around this is I think academics could really work and help in several ways. The first one is around helping countries to draft new commitments according to context, priorities in that particular country, um, and, and to give it a bit more of a focus. And that's also around reviewing, for example, model commitments, but then also around monitoring and evaluation. I think we need a framework. What does success look like um, in this kind of framework? Um, and, and so that would be, I think, uh, quite, quite useful uh, at this stage. So thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for that wonderful overview of the summit. Uh, sort of where we are with the commitments, you know, sort of the, I guess, the traje trajectory of commitments from the first summit to the second summit, sort of positive growth in some ways, um, but areas where we can still continue to do some work and, and sort of think about how, as we kind of get to the conversations about what a community looks like, how we can fold uh, the academic community into some of these conversations. So thank you um, very much for that, Julia. Now we're going to um, begin act two. I'm not sure if Pat has yet been able to join us, but anyway, let me turn over to you, David and Marcella. I hope that you can tell us a little bit, sort of building on Julia's presentation, tell us a little bit about um, the model commitments that the Carter Center and International Idea worked on, getting input from other organizations you know, why have them, what do they do? How do they fit in also into, into the sort of broader global discussion of norms and standards? This isn't right the first time that we've talked about uh, standards for elections. How, do, how does this all fit into that larger picture? And again, how can we sort of bring the academic community into these conversations about model commitments? So maybe I'll turn to you first, David, and then, and then Marcella, or however you'd like to, to have this conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Avery, and um, I'm not sure <clears throat> when Pat will join, but we'll gladly um, bring him into the conversation when he's here. Um, it's great that I can be here with Pat, hopefully, and Marcella, because it's really the three of us who together worked on, on the document that we are calling Model Commitments for, for Democracy Focused on Elections. Uh, to kind of step back and connect it to Julia's uh, intervention in Act One, um, you know, this started, the, our conversations about this started more than a year ago when, or actually even leading up to the first Summit for Democracy activity and a number of groups that were coming together and what's called the elections cohort as part of the process, we're trying to decide, was this process going to lead to a useful outcome, the Summit for Democracy process, and how could we engage in a way that would be helpful? And you know, we going into the summit, we were aware that the, the quality of a lot of the commitments was not that great. We knew that many organizations would be trying to, to monitor them, even though they weren't necessarily the strongest commitments that could be made. And so we decided, you know, some time ago, about a year ago, that we would want to work together on something like what this document has emerged as model commitments. 
and drew, drew together, decided to work on this jointly uh, with International IDEA, Carter Center, and then NDI and IFAS joining us to try to build and draw from our vast international experience. We know what good democratic elections look like. We know what the normative framework looks like and to try to put a document together that would help nudge countries to have stronger, better commitments based on what we know is good practice and, and what international standards are. And so the document that exists has an overarching commitment on genuine elections, five uh, thematic core uh, commitments on legal framework, election administration, electoral integrity, uh, information integrity, and international support for democracy. And then each of those has more targeted uh, language for commitments. And again, each of these draws on our international experience. They're all linked to specific references and sources that we already know in the normative global framework uh, that really anchors them in existing uh, good practice and existing recognized standards and obligations. And it's really intended, again, to be this tool that countries can use and all countries around the world can look at this and say, you know, here's an area where, where we could uh, do better in our, in our own country and in our own uh, democratic election process. So it's, it's part of this, you know, a similar thing that we see in many other areas internationally where there's peer accountability. It's a peer review mechanism essentially by making commitments and our effort is to try to raise the level of those to the strongest possible, again, but they're ideals. And so countries can pick and choose where they might want to, to engage on these. Um, I think that's the main thing I would say so far and see if, uh, I don't know if, if, has Pat joined yet? And if not, um, we can it see- It does not look like he is here with us yet. So maybe just Marcella. Okay. Uh, Marcella, maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, again, as a, a co-creator of this document and as somebody who's uh, just finishing, just finished your PhD research and deeply engaged in the academic community, how would you, uh, you know, look at this from the perspective of, of an academic researcher and how this can be tied to what we're trying to achieve internationally? Yeah, I think it's a really um, great kind of structure that's been built um, that like we could let that, that the academic mind or the academic kind of work could could then test right so um, the practitioners in the room have kind of put together a list of things that we think are um, in, critically important and rooted that in the standards and kind of the you know the international treaties and even state best practice kind of work um, and I think there's just a lot of inherent questions of are countries better off if they do this? I think inherently I would expect the answer to be yes, but that's certainly an empirical question and a testable, um, testable piece, especially when you consider the types of data that are out there, whether it's the EIP, you know, PEI data or VDAM or other types of measures of democracy, of development, of um, um, kind of corruption and those types of things that could be measured against this of Kind of if and when a country adopts kind of a policy that's in line with these model commitments or the commitments they've made through summit for democracy are they better off right this is waving a magic data wand this is removing all selection effects that could possibly be in this but truly are these are we zeroing in on the right things are these the the kind of mechanisms are addressing these types of issues and improving in these ways mechanisms that improve lives on the ground or institution durability and those types of things. Um, I think there's also inherent kind of in what Julia was talking about, a really interesting question of what are countries identifying for themselves? Are they identifying and doubling down on places where they're inherently strong? Or are they taking this as an international opportunity to improve in places where they need a lot of work? Again, probably selection effects abounding this, but to me, that's a really interesting question of um, this kind of how do countries see this international, this kind of new international summit for democracy process, but also are countries in or even which countries are interested in addressing what types of problems um, and are there um, kind of strong um, identifiers for different types of countries in this kind of world. Um, I think the Ireland example that Julia put together pretty pretty nicely summarizes this in some other work that um, 
we, the, another person in the room with us did, Ian and I, really Ian put together, it seemed like some of these, and I think Ireland was one of them, kind of already had the legislation in place to achieve this commitment and to achieve this goal. Um, or, you know, is that kind of, to, is that a credit claiming story? Are these kind of some of these canonical IR um, international institutions type stories, or are we seeing something different? Is there a different kind of pathway here? So our country is actually identifying something that they can aspire to or already achieve. And I think that would, to me is an interesting question in that as well. Um, and the third thing that I think academics could really help with, right? If you have deep case knowledge and those types of things is to, there are gaps. There's gaps in the normative framework. There's gaps in our understanding of um, what is transferable and reliably kind of normatively the right answer for something like campaign finance, right? Which is generally seen, I think, from the PEI data as well, like as one of the lower performing, one of the bigger challenges in, in um, understanding election quality and almost prescribing election quality. So are there places that you all know that have you done case studies of or you've lived and worked that does one of these things very, very well? Are there common threads that are extractable and transferable kind of to the broader community that we as a you know international organization or international group of people who are interested in elections and intellectual quality, um, are there places that we should be looking that we haven't identified yet? Um, to me, those are some of the kind of areas where collaboration would be really welcome and really powerful on these areas. I agree. Um, maybe one other thing I can can add to this is um, while the um, the vast majority of what's in the document that we have on, on model commitments is is not really new and it draws from the existing normative framework and it really just tries to package good commitments and good practices there's a few issue areas that are you know we're all aware are emerging uh about you know data privacy data security information integrity election technology where there and and, and also campaign finance that are a little bit um less clear in terms of the normative framework and those gaps that we've spoken about but also the other thing that's uh, I think a little different with this document is a, a, a last commitment on international democracy and support. So mm -hmm. and it really tries to, I think, in the spirit of the Summit for Democracy, try to, and, and also some of the commitments that countries themselves have made, connect to those actions that are about showing support internationally to democracy generally and to the efforts of other countries to advance democracy and elections in their country. Thank you. Both. That was a very helpful sort of overview of what's included in the model commitment sort of broadly and how they're rooted in, in um, existing commitments and frameworks that we're probably familiar with, but also the ways that they're different. I also really appreciated the research questions that you started pulling out, Marcella, and I hope that somebody takes us up on some of those ideas. Um, so thank you both so much for that. I was sort of segueing now to, to Act 3. Um, Clara, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about sort of what these commitments might mean for implementers. How do we sort of translate norms into action on the ground and number to kind of tell us a little bit about how what role community plays in this process going forward um and and, and how we build a broad network but maybe starting with you clara thank you thank you avery um i think i mean yeah, good afternoon, good evening, as you said, and it's, it's really a pleasure to be part of this panel and to be able to speak with everyone today. I mean, I think um, sort of looking at um, the points that I've sort of worked through, um, I hope to be able to build and reinforce some of the points that we've talked about, at least around principles, normative frameworks, because I think those are the things that help shape um, the work and influence the work of implementers such as as, such as IFAS. Um, I think just to start, I think for us, it's clear um, it's in, in, this, in this group, I think we can all agree that elections are not, not, no longer the singular marker of a democracy. Nonetheless, an election conducted according to internationally accepted standards is an important indication of the health of a country's 
democracy. And I think, again, we can all agree that there is a common understanding of what constitutes a credible elections. Um, I think also what is clear looking at the model commitments, the legal frameworks and national circumstances of countries' democratic arrangements vary. Um, and to have an election with integrity, this election, the election must be seen to be as well as perceived to be inclusive, transparent, fair, and credible. But then what does it mean to have an election judged as credible and fair? I think it's important. I think some of the things that we discussed in terms of the election must reflect the will of the eligible population. Um, the election process must be inclusive of all eligible voters. The inclusion of those that reflect the political spectrum, the diversity of the diversity reflected in that country. So this includes women, persons living with disabilities, indigenous people all to the aim of demonstrating the country's commitment, that country's commitment to a reflective and inclusive process. Um, again, I think um, because I, we, as an implementer, we, we, we appreciate that elections are a collective national effort that involves a multitude of national stakeholders, some of which we as IFAS work with, and these are the election management bodies, obviously, but non-traditional uh, stakeholders that people can think of, including civil society, the police, as well as the judiciary. Um, the citizens' perceptions of the integrity of these institutions is invariably linked to their perception of the credibility and integrity of the aspect of the process for which these institutions are responsible for. And so therefore, um, the for us, um, again, sort of, um, looking at sort of how IFAS works in, in some of these countries. Um, IFAS works with these national stakeholders on their respective efforts to increase trust in processes that are inclusive and deliver for the people by not only strengthening the processes, but also the capacity of the institution. Um, as I said, from election management bodies to civil society and the police, I, and the police, IFA supports these stakeholders to be more professional, more communicative, more responsive and transparent in their decision-making processes, as these are some of the benchmarks that define integrity. Um, and, um, and, and sort of that's working nationally and working in specific countries. I mean, IFAS works from at least in Africa, which is my purview. Um, we, I mean, we, 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 we have, we, we, we are in Senegal, from Senegal to Ethiopia and Nigeria to Zambia, IFRS programming seeks to advance good governance and democratic rights um, by providing technical assistance to these election officials and empowering the underrepresented to participate in the political process and applying field-based research to improve the, the cycle and the, pro and the and specific aspects of the process. Um, uh, and, and maybe sort of uh, quickly, I think, that sort of on the national and individual sort of country specific basis, um, on the global scale, on the global level, um, I, one of the things that I, we as IFAS um, have done and have participated in is the global network for securing electoral integrity, which is a relatively new network. And I know that Ambar will speak to this a bit more in detail but it's a network which convenes election stakeholders around a shared vision of inspiring and informing actions which advance electoral integrity in the face of some of the critical threats to democracy. Um, and, and maybe just to emphasize the imperative that um, the efforts to promote and enable electoral integrity is and should be seen as a collective and collaborative effort one which includes the voice and thought leadership of not only academ academia, but implementers and donor agencies such as USAID. I think it, 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 is, it is this imperative that um, recognizing some of the challenges and opportunities that we've highlighted and I'm sure have been discussed over the course of the past few days, um, this idea that we must work as a community of practice, not only in 
in researching um, issues and topics that are critical in, in sort of a theoretical sense, but then the application of that in a more practical sense for implementers such as our such as such as IFAS, but um, but then recognizing that in order to work in specific countries, we need we need funding, we need resources um to be able to to be able to make this to, to be able to have that impact and so it is it it really is a collective effort that 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 requires a joined up approach um and so i think that sort of in that joined up approach and 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 thinking of ourselves in this uh in this collective manner um i think um I will let Umbar speak to sort of that that the role and how building that role as a community of practice um, continues to evolve and continues to require shaping. Thank you, Umbar, or 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 back to you, Avery. <laughs> oh, please, Umbar, please. We'd love to hear. Thank you, Clara. First of all, and, and Umbar, we'd love to hear more about um, you know your role at USAID, sort of bringing this network together and sort of how you see it as responding to some of some of the challenges that we are facing in this moment for for global democracy. Yeah, um, well, thank you, Avery, and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on the panel today. Uh, so let's start with why we're having this conversation in the first place today. I think um, gathered here today, I think all of us would agree that the elections environment globally has seen a number of fundamental changes in the last de decade. And we really find ourselves at this unique moment in time. You could call it a precipice. You could call it a crossroads. You could call it a turning point. It's a moment which, in time which necessitates um, thinking and looking at election integrity in a new way and, and really thinking about how we can ensure that elections really do and are about the will of the people, right? And how do we go about responding to the increasing number of challenges in an increasingly interconnected world? Um, it's an important question. Uh, I think we'd all agree that we can't really do it individually anymore, um, but how do we work in concert as a community? And if we are talking about a community, who belongs to that community? What type of community? So I'll come back to that in just a bit. Um, from the perspective of a donor, you know, how, USAID has seen the evolution of election assistance, for example, we really started out looking at election assistance as building capacity, capacity of election officials, capacity of election observers, political parties, um, you know, the, this group of, of uh, people we were targeting, we could easily identify what the capacity deficits were, we jump in with training or uh, technical assistance, but really the challenges today are not as easy to define and to address, um, nor are they really generally uh, uh, limited to a lack of capacity, linked to a lack of capacity. There's something probably much more insidious, a little bit more troubling underlying a lot of these challenges. It's a lack of political will. It's a deliberate attempt by many actors to undermine democratic elections and their outcomes. Um, but before we turn to some of these negative trends, which I think Avery's mentioned some of already, I also want to point out that there is good news on the election, global election front. Um, for example, we have seen the global trend towards autocracy that remains troubling, but we've also seen in recent years that elections play a crucial role in countering autocracy. VDEM this year looked at eight countries that recently made U-turns toward democracy after a period of authoritarianism and found that you know, a very key element in the bounce back factor was critical elections bringing an alternation in power. Um, you know, in, since the 1970s, research finds that uh, a number of co countries, their constitutions have started mandating some type of election management. And that number has more than doubled since the 1970s. VDEM's election management body capacity index also shows over the same period that election management bodies have continued to strengthen their capacity. They've continued to increase their resilience and professionalism, despite the increasing challenges to their work. Um, we've seen documents, many of the people in this panel have worked on Declaration of Principles for International Observation, the Declaration of Global Principles for Citizen Election Observation. All of these have really helped strengthen the credibility and professionalization of election observation worldwide, and really were a collective effort um, in, this, in this work towards election integrity. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that election environment is increasingly 
complex around the world is growing more complex by the minute. Avery, you mentioned some of these already at the beginning. I mean, we're seeing rapid digital innovations. They make some election processes much more efficient, but on the other hand, they also cause problems for transparency, data protection, cybersecurity. There's more and more attacks on the information environment. Um, there's alternative narratives which cast doubt on elections and their outcomes. We see political processes and electoral institutions, which are often co-opted. Um, there's repression of civil society, media, and citizens in some countries. And of course, we continue to see women, youth, and so many other marginalized groups, which uh, continue to face enormous barriers to their political participation and leadership. Then we also see these trends of polarization, hate speech, and other worrying um, worrying issues. And of course, the impact of global shocks um, in most recent years, of course, climate change is a, is a big one that we talk about at USAID conflict. And of course, the entire world was affected by pandemics in recent years. And all of these add extra pressure around sensitive processes. All of this is stuff that all of you know, but I think it's worth just pointing out that you know these global conversations, um, these global challenges have really led to a crisis in citizens' trust in elections around the world. Every single country um, recently, it seems, is is facing these kinds of issues, and this really impacts the legitimacy of those who are elected and the work that they can do. Now, I do want to point out that there's one fundamental difference also. Um, in the challenges that we're facing today versus the challenges that we faced um, in, in the past. And that is that none of these challenges are constrained by borders. The problems we're seeing in the election integrity space in the global north are exactly the same that we see in the global south, those in emerging countries and established democratic nations. All of us are facing many of the similar challenges um, that you know, together. So I'd like to hearken back to a word I used earlier, which is interconnectedness, because let's face it, an election in one country is not just going to have to be something that's impacting people who live in that country. It's going to have a geopolitical impact. It's going to impact stability, security, not just in the region, but also potentially um, beyond to the rest of the world. So this is why I think we need to start adapting the conversations around elections to meet the challenges of today. And that's not the challenges of the 1940s or the 1990s, but the very different challenges of today, which is that we can, and, and this is at the same time that we continue to continue to grapple, of course, with some of the same issues that we've dealt with for um, for decades. But the time is really ripe now for these global conversations about the future of democracy in general. And this is really what the summits for democracy were trying to ignite. Ignite. It was a global and broad based commitment to democratic norms, not just from the usual suspects, not just from those of us who agree democracy is the way forward but from those who might be on the fence and also to remind countries um, you know, that have had a democratic uh, tradition for many years that uh, there's always dangers, there's always challenges and we all need to be on our guard. So it's really important that we broaden that conversation at this moment. So one of the initiatives that arose from the summits um, was this global network for securing electoral integrity. Um, the world's leading organizations and actors that work to support election integrity really came together to support for the first time, a standing platform for a systematic and regular collaboration. Um, we're hoping it'll be continue to be with a diverse set of partners who really need to work together to modernize our election approaches. USA, it's really proud to be a part of the network. Um, this launched in March of this year, ahead of the second summit for democracy. Uh, thus far, the network Network includes intergovernmental bodies, it has international development agencies, international NGOs, and election related networks from around the world. Many of the groups who are part of this panel today, um, the Carter Center, International Idea, IFAS, NDI, also played really active roles in the foundation of this um, network. So the network really is serving as a community of practice. Um, it's hoping to revitalize conversations about and approaches to promote a consistent set of norms um, for what constitutes transparent, competitive, inclusive, and peaceful elections. Some of those um, norms that Clara mentioned uh, that implementers work with on a daily basis to, to get into their programs really elections that reflect the will of all the people. It's a call to action for the election integrity community. And it recognizes that we all have to work together to advocate for global norms and really be united when we take action to advance electoral integrity. This does require us to take um, stock of what our existing assumptions are, what our existing approaches are, what the principles, practices, and norms we've been working with 
are and where there might be gaps, um, as Marcella mentioned. And I think this is where academia could really work with implementers and um, donor agencies to really take stock of where we are and what the evidence shows so that we can base action that we take um, in evidence. The two objectives that the, and the network has set for itself is one, to strengthen the election integrity norms framework, and two, to provide a standing platform for an expanded network of actors. As part of the first objective, um, the network is really trying to promote awareness and adherence to existing norms. So that's one part of it. But then also, as we've mentioned, some of these new challenges have arisen around which there are not existing norms and good practices. And that's an area that we're going to be looking at um, and, and thinking about what we what should be done in those spaces. And then actually also actively advocating for new or renewed commitments and actions where needed. So in the first few years, we focused in on on norms building around two priority issues. Um, one is safeguarding the independence of election management bodies. And then the second is genuine and inclusive dialogues around electoral reform processes. I mentioned the second objective, which was um, about how continuing these dialogues. And one of the parts of that objective is really prioritizing building bridges with other sectors. So, you know, we have an election integrity community that already exists. We all talk to each other all the time, but there are other actors in this space that really do touch on the election space. So we're talking about rule of law actors, human rights practitioners, anti-corruption bodies, media, um, and of course, the technology sector, which we can't forget, the technology has this huge impact on elections, um, and we do need to take them into account and be having conversations with them. And then again, in tying this back to commitments, we really feel that election integrity is not limited to this narrow group, group of stakeholders that's been working on election integrity directly, but rather this broader set of stakeholders which have a role to play. We really need to be committed together, and this network is going to allow us to take the discussion on model commitments and global norms out to a larger audience, we hope, if we're successful. I'm going to stop here and turn it back to Avery, but I just wanted to make one final point and just reiterate a point that I, I made. Is, the issues we're facing are universal, so we need to engage in these universal and broad conversations. It isn't a global north and a global south issue. We can't work in individual silos any longer, and we really have to work in partnership to not only just have the meaningful conversations we need to have, but also brainstorm the solutions and their and and, and their implementation and also commit to adherence to election integrity norms, both new and old. So this includes research, this includes collection of evidence, and then having honest conversations about what's working, what isn't working, and where there are gaps uh, that we need to fill. So the conversations that began at the Summit for Our Democracy initiatives, such as the Global Network for Securing Electoral Integrity and these model commitments, again, are great starting points, as we mentioned, um, but we really have to work together as a community to take them forward. Um, from the starting point to much further. So back to, over to you, Avery. Thank you so much, Amber. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for the great contributions. I think we covered a lot of ground in about 45 minutes from sort of overview of the summit to a little bit of delving into model commitments and some discussion about research questions to like what it means to really be an implementer with specifically with Clara's focus on, on Africa, but things that could be sort of more broadly applied in a, in a global sense to sort of Umber's contributions around um, the need for this this network to sort of continue these conversations going forward, recognizing that these are, are universal challenges that we are facing and apply to all of us. We all need to sort of be pulling in the same direction. 